Yeah, this is fine. This is fine. This is good. Yeah, okay. this is good. Okay. No, but before doing that, let me say a few things. Sorry for the delay. A uh, few things about Professor uh, Mohlanovich. That's what I was asked to say. I joined the Indian Statistical Institute in February of 1971, late years of Professor's life. I had a chance to speak to him only twice. I saw him speaking before the ISI faculty and staff on several occasions, but I had the opportunity to speak to him only on two occasions. The first time I met him, when I, maybe two, three months after my joining the ISI, I met him in one of those gatherings, I guess. And he asked me uh, what my research interest is. And I said, it is non-parametric inference. In those days, I was working mainly on rank order statistics. And then he, it was not a joke. He was serious. He says, is projective geometry a part of non-parametric inference? And I was naive. So I really, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to make a joke, actually, I think. I said, Ars, Professor R.C. Bowles was the expert in those days in projective geometry. He was alive, still alive. I said, Professor Bowles will possibly not say so. And then, of course, he didn't say anything. But my colleagues said, actually, you're amazed <laughs> or intrigued, whatever, uh, by my audacity. They said, why do you <laughs> want uh, actually, this was my, for him, for a young faculty just joining the institute, it was, for them, it looked like an audacious thing. So that was the first occasion. I thought it was a joke that Professor Arce Bolson say projective geometry is a part of non-parametric inference. The second time was, of course, something which I agreed immediately. For him, he used to say that everything is discrete, actually, in statistics. There is nothing continuous. And he's right. Everything, if you think about it, type, that continuity is just an approximation. Discrete distribution, you draw the histogram, then approximate to this bell shape, do it by normal. So those are the two occasions, personal occasions. But I have heard him uh, speak before a large crowd, as I said, ISI faculty and stuff. I'll say a few, couple of things, not very many, about his contribution. Most of you, of course, know the Mahalanavish's distance, the D square. Everybody talks about it in the multivariate course, definitely. Then, and even now, that is still there. And he was actually one of the big founders of survey sampling in India, crop cutting experiments in Gerardy, interpenetrating sample, and others. He was definitely one of the pioneers of that experience. What people do not know is essentially he is the one who did first the bootstrap. He didn't use the term, and obviously, people attribute to Efron and very right appropriately. But it was he, even in the mid 40s, when he was talking about resampling and bootstrap. If you really want to see it, you read a long article by Peter Hall. Peter Hall, you all know, is a probabilist mathematical statistician. And, but he wrote something on an article on Bootstrap, a review article, or I think it is, I'm not sure, for some encyclopedia or all that, where he gave a very, very long count of how Mohola Anubish was one of the essentially pioneers, even in Bootstrap, without using the name, one of the pioneers in resampling. That is what it is, including Bootstrap. So the thing what I want to say about Professor Mohlanovich, he was a man of vision. We do lots of technical things, we prove theorems, etc., get glory out of it. But Mohlanovich was a visionary. 
he was actually the founder not only of the institute, founder of statistics in India, but people didn't know even what statistics says, what are the potentials, and he could see the potential. The reason why ISI, Indian Statistical Institute, is so big today is definitely due to Mohammed's pioneering contribution. Actually, he was also involved with the third, uh, second plan commission. Uh, he used the input output model of Leontief, which was used for years, years, and years by the planning people. Just one simple equation, and that was such a powerful one. So, as I said, a visionary had the highest regards for him, and I will hold <laughs> my highest regards for him. He used to make a joke, actually, sometimes, with, uh, in one of the meetings, he said, Ki janto, ki osho, tumra to bolo, ama statistics and knowledge minimal. What did you want to say? He was pointing at Ashok Maitra and Jayanta Kosh, two of the past directors of the Indian Statistical Institute, both passed away. Actually, I'm very sorry <laughs> to see both of them gone. But uh, just trying to make a joke that they were not there. Also, I don't know whether they really said that, but they said the knowledge of statistics is minimal. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so here it is. We're talking to people. Okay, so far about Professor Malanovich. The talk I'm going to give is on small area estimation, a topic I've been working on for the last three decades. What I'm going to give is evolution from the 70s until now, so five decades. What I'll do basically, the talk will be of three parts. I start with an introduction, which will be at synthetic estimation. That's the early part of the story, basically in the 70s. The model-based estimation came in the late 70s and it is still used, of course, but the topics which I'm talking about there is some of the earlier topics in the 80s and 90s. So that is the second part of the talk and more recent things like benchmarking, fixed versus random effects, variable transformation, all those things I'll bring in at the end. Now, there is a miscellaneous remarks. That's a real thing. The topics I have covered is only a small subset of what small area estimation today has developed into. My student Partho Lahiri gives a whole semester course on small area estimation. And he can, one can do it very easily. The topic has grown so much that you can possibly even go beyond a semester, in my opinion, and talk about the different techniques. For those of you who are interested, I'll mention the second edition of the book by Jane Keral and Isabel Molina. Please look at it. That is still possibly within a year or so, that will also become one of the things of the past because so many new developments. That book, the second edition appeared in 2015 or something, I'm not sure. Can't recall exact date, but 2021, and so much has happened since then. Believe me, everybody is working on it, and now with the advent of big data, there will be even more stuff coming up each and every. So, with this kind of prelude, let me start into. My goodness, I cannot now move it. What happened? I cannot move it now. No, it's moving. Uh, just do a page down, maybe. I'm trying the page down. That's why I'm saying. Use an arrow? Yeah, I'm using that arrow. Believe me. <laughs> I know that. I've been using that all the time. Yeah, because it's moving within the page, but not... Or maybe they'll... Uh... You have to say something else. No, no. So that single page mode that you selected, I think maybe you should go back and undo that. <laughs> yeah. So you were screen sharing. No, so the top I... left uh, where you selected single page mode, uh, I think. Where is it? The top left means? Uh... No, the one where you had presentation and not that. I think it should be on the menu. Two pages. No. 
And then I can still, will I do it? No, it is, that's the best I can do it seems like, if I had to, is that okay? Uh, no. no, but this should not have to anything to do with going to the next page. So single page should allow you to go to the next page, surely. No, I, I had the single page mode. That's why I'm surprised. Single page. No, go to continue. Okay, above that, no, just go back to the same thing. The same one. Uh -huh. Above that, uh, just above single page, it says continuous scroll. Continuous scroll. Yeah, there, now you are. Now you can move down. Now it is ideal. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. I think we'll get single page only. Okay. Okay. Much better now. Is yeah, okay this is or? this is this is perfect. Please, yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Good. Okay. So let's start. What is smaller estimation? For some of you, it may be the first time you're hearing this term, this word. It is one of several statistical techniques involving estimation, small supposed population of interest, including larger survey. For example, if a big survey is for the state, my state is Florida, state of Florida. After the big survey, we want similar data, similar uh, for counties. Then go to sub counties, census tracts, school districts, everything. So you can go to lower and still further lower levels of geography. So sub populations in a larger survey. So it could be a small geographical area, as I said, or it can even be a small domain. For example, you can think about people without health insurance. That's what the topic is we are trying to find for Asian subpopulation. And you classify the Asian subpopulation into Chinese, Indians, etc., Vietnamese, Koreans, others. And also you can say age, sex, etc., etc., etc. So there will be several small areas, so small domain, that's what they call. Not just the area, the smallness of the targeted population. And why smallness? I'll tell you, which constitutes the basis of the smaller estimation. This is the story. If a survey is targeted towards a population of interest with prescribed accuracy, I'll give an example later. For example, you want to have a survey people without insurance, in the state of Florida. And then you want to go towards, this was actually a survey conducted a long time ago in the late nineties. And then you get the sample size to achieve the prescribed accuracy, that's fine. But then when you go to the subpopulation, the sample size may not be adequate to generate similar accuracy. Somebody might survive hold another sample set. No, you just can't do that. The reason simply is the following, that you don't have the resources to conduct a second survey. So when you go, get to all the small subpopulations, you have to use the same data. And as a result thereof, you do not have the usually the precision you want for those at the subpopulation level. Okay. So a domain or area estimator is direct if it is based only on the domain specific sample data. It is regarded as small if domain specific sample is not large enough to produce estimates of desired precision. So that's why the term small area estimation is coming. But what do you do? If the population size increases, it may not always be the case. For example, think about, uh, say for example, uh, Vietnamese, they are talking about health insurance for all the counties of the United States. You go to one of the mountain states, Wyoming or Utah, and there you are looking for Vietnamese subpopulation. Well, or Korean, whatever it is, you may not find any. <laughs> there are examples of small areas and then you're cross-classifying by age, sex, etc. I have seen 
zero uh, sample in a small sub area. So this requires use of the additional data, either administrative data, now it is that's taking, occupying a big role with the advent of big data, administrative data is actually playing a huger and huger role, <laughs> not used in the original survey or data from other related areas. And the resulting estimates are called indirect estimates that borrow strengths for the variable of interest from related areas of time periods to increase the effective sample size. So even if you are interested, for example, for a particular county in Florida, we live in Alachua County, you go to the next county, Gilchrist or Dixie and add some, especially it is true for Dixie and Gilchrist, they're so small counties, you have to combine them and bring in Alachua to get a sizable population. And this is usually done to the use of models, explicit or implicit. I'll talk about some implicit things in the uh, first and related areas and time periods. So it could be spatial time models, temporal models also, although I'm not talking about it. Nowadays, there is research going on there. Now, just a little bit of history, uh, 11th century England, 17th century Canada, census administrative records played a big role and demographers of course they are using indirect methods they used to call indirect estimators they did never use the term small area estimation as such but they used indirect methods for characteristic of interest full census census is taking place every 10 years so they have to do something some kind of indirect estimation because the census figures are may not be any reliable when you move farther and farther away from the last decennial census. So of course, nowadays, the demand has increased worldwide, policies, programs, allocation of government funds, etc. And one of the big examples, which is happening in Washington, now possibly about 25 years, I think, SAPI, Small Area Income and Poverty Estimation, mandated actually by the US legislature. I think it was 19. And demand for the private sector also increased because business decisions, those related to business, rely heavily on global socioeconomic conditions. And Eastern European countries in transition, former Soviet Union countries, when they moved away from centralized decision making, it's a big thing. For example, Poland is a great example. A small area estimation is actually doing. Of course, there are other places small uh, as well, like all the Balkan countries, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and others. Poland is a big one. I go there quite often. That's why I know a lot about Poland, particularly. So as a result, sample surveys are used to produce estimates for large and small areas. I'll give some examples before I start synthetic estimation, hierarchical base estimates, overweight prevalence, national health and nutrition exam survey by the actually CDC and uh, then county average crop estimates, this is the USDA people, crop acreage using remote sensing satellite data as well as auxiliary information. Income for small faces, that's essentially the starting of the model based approach in smaller estimation, the classic paper of Fay and Harriet, although Harriet is spelled wrong here, have corrected it later, missed it here. Model based county estimates, 12, K to 12 children of poverty every year. Part of the SAPI program, it is an essential part of the SAPI. Estimation of median household income, that started a long time ago and continuing nowadays every year because of the SAPI figures and empirical hierarchical based methods for small area poverty measures. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, there is a paper actually based on uh, the stock and giving already published in transition, statistics in transition coming out of Poland, 
And there are several discussions and two of the discussions discuss quite a bit, still not all 100% of the research, poverty measures, different levels of small area poverty measures. This is a long story. Before I start synthetic estimation, is there any question? I'll pause for a second and you can unmute for a second and ask if someone wants to ask anything. If not, I will move again, move ahead with synthetic estimation. Is that okay? Shall I move? All right. Yeah, I think you can go ahead. So estimator is called synthetic. If it is a direct estimator, uh, for a large area covering a small area used as an indirect estimator for the area. U.S. National Center for Health Statistics, those are the people who are also involved in all sorts of things, including people without health insurance, estimating people without health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So strong underlying assumption is the small area bears the same characteristic, but the large area. So look at it, I have some symbols, have M areas for the ith area, the direct estimate is YI, but precision is so small, they don't like it. So they take the overall estimate. They take the population sizes for all the all the estimate, all the areas within that big area and take the overall weighted average. So, and obviously the idea is synthetic estimator has least less mean squared error. Of course, the bias, if the bias is not too strong, if the bias is very strong, it is a disaster. Because what is the mean squared error? It is variance plus square of the bias. You have reduced the variance, but the bias is up way high, sky high. You are really in trouble. Hansen, Hurwitz, and Maddow applied synthetic estimation Context of radio. This is a classic paper, but I took it from Rao as Bolina's second edition. Long time ago, it is the pre-television era. And synthetic estimation of the median number of radio station heard during the day in 500, more than 500 counties. Not all the counties of US. There are more than 3000 counties in the US, but they, they concentrated on more than 500 counties. I don't know which area particularly. The direct estimate is one, the unknown median MI for a radio listening survey based on personal interviews. Then that had the estimate XI of MI obtained from a male survey used as a single covariate in the linear regression of YI and XI. The male survey actually conducted sampling 10,000 families for each county area. So 500 times 1,000 is a big number. But the response rate was 20%. So it became essentially 1,000 times 100. So that's what it is, or 100 times 500. The same thing. And incomplete coverage, but still was very, very useful. So direct estimates for 85 county areas are obtained by intensive interview survey. The selection was made by stratifying the population of the 585 strata based on geographical radian, available radio service type. One county from each stratum was selected. 85 strata, 85 counties. Probability proportional to the estimated number of families in the counties. Now you might say it is kind of biased. The places where the number of families are bigger, it will be, it, that is the one you'll pick up, sure. <clears throat> most likely to pick up. That is going to happen possibly, but it is okay possibly because if there are more people, possibly there'll be more radio stations so they can at least get some kind of idea. So it was okay at that time. And they took a subsample of area segments and then they found that correlation between Y's and X's as 70.70 and non-sampled counties regression estimates turned out this way. So another example of synthetic estimation, Maria Gonzalez and Christine Horda, those are, I think they are the ones 
to first coin the term small area estimation. At least that's what I've told because I don't know exactly if someone else used the term before that. So what is objective? Develop intercentral estimates of various population characteristics of interest. So they discuss synthetic estimates of unemployment. The larger area is a big geographic division, small area is a county. That's their target. So instead of, so county I is the one you are interested, look at the population, uh, proportion of labor force in the county I, that's PIG. So instead of using the county I direct estimate for county I, they took an indirect estimate. UJ took the corresponding unemployment rate for cell J, the big geographic division where county I belongs. And all they did, they took the PIJs because that was available, but instead of the ith county estimate, they took the average, weighted average summation, PIJ UJ, which is UI star, what is called. They also suggested synthetic regression estimate for unemployment rate, but I'm not getting into that. I'm going immediately into what is used now. They call them comp composite estimators. The estimators are weighted average of direct estimators and synthetic estimators. Why? Balance. The design bias, I've already talked about, synthetic estimates will be very biased much more precision because more the merrier in some sense, more samples, so large, smaller variance. But the large variability of direct estimators in a small area. So if you take, for example, yij, the characteristic of interest j unit in the height area, you have the vector auxiliary characteristics and some simple notations, the population means of yi bar, population means of the auxiliary characteristic xi bar, I'm taking it as a scalar. You have the samples of the yij, sample mean of the characteristic of interest, auxiliary character uh, variable, sam average, sample average is xi bar, and then what happened? Direct estimator is what? Just take the yi bar, xi bar, an XI bar, the capital XI bar. You know, for the auxiliary characteristic, you know the overall mean. That is typically the case. But what they kept, the XI bar is known, so they kept it XI bar, but instead of YI bar, they put Y bar S, or XI bar, they put X bar S, and, and these are the weighted averages as we talked about. So now what they did, they took this composite average, Look at the first term. This first term, it is just one over ni summation yij j from one to ni. So the scene part, you are not doing anything. Scene part, you are leaving it undisturbed. For the unseen part, you are using the estimate and that estimate you are using the y bar s divided by x bar s. But x bar i prime you are using for the auxiliary characteristics as such, you are using the right. But you may say, okay, they're unseen. So how can I get the XI bar? The reason why I can get it, you know the overall population total, you know the overall sample total, so you know the overall total of the auxiliary characteristics only, not the response variable for the unseen observations. Just this simple identity gives you a composite estimate. I'll give another simple interpretation. This, those kind of things were used to be published in JASA in those days, not anymore. People have become a lot more sophisticated. A model-based justification. How do you do that? Just take the model. Yij is bi, bxij sigma square xij. Don't have to assume normality of it. Take the best linear unbiased estimate. If it is normal, it is the best unbiased estimator, and you minimize this with respect to B and the solution turns out to be the overall average of the Y's divided by the overall average of the X's. Now, as I said, the seen part, you don't anything, but the unseen part, you put the estimate for V hat, you get the expression given in the table. So that's a model-based, just simple model-based justification. 
we have become much more sophisticated and we'll talk about much more uh, actually sophisticated model based estimation later. That's the second part of the talk. And I'm already getting there. Model based estimation, area level models. So, what is it? Explicitly link the sampling models with random area specific effects. There will be essentially mixed effects model, which everybody possibly knows here. So, it accounts for between area variation beyond that is explained by auxiliary variables. So, auxiliary variables are there. In the earlier thing, we used some kind of model, but it did not use the small area random effect. They can now they've found out there would be, should be a random effect pertaining to the given small area. So area level models, small area direct estimates to area specific covariates plus random area effect. And this is all, most of us who are secondary users of survey, that's what you get. There is confidentiality issues. They typically nowadays, they give up to the county level. If I ask them census level or census tracts or school level, they said, no, we won't be able to give that to you because of confidentiality. Census Bureau is doing that. If you are belong there for a while as an employee, then you can access. And there are people who can access and they can do better analysis for unit level model. Unit level models relate unit values, study variable to unit specific co covariates. And these indirect estimators are, of course, model based estimators. No question about it. There are several advantages which I've listed. First, optimal estimators can be derived under the assumed model. Of course, what happens with model failure, I'll talk later. Area specific measures of variability can be associated, unlike global measures often used with traditional, because we are talking about direct uh, model. Whenever you are talking about a model, you can talk about model uncertainty. Bayesians do better than the standard frequentist approach. I'll talk about it. That models can be validated from the sample data. One can entertain a variety of models, depending on the nature of response variable, complexity of data structures. Fifth, model-based approach can still provide estimates for areas with zero sample size. Very important. And the people who are actually, do the people who do application of all these small areas, they face a number of times with zero sample size. And it is only the regression estimate and the classic model estimate, Fay and Harriet, you can see it is a mixed effects model. You can think about it in a Bayesian way or frequentist way. Yi is theta i plus ei. Theta i link, there's a sampling model. Ei is of the sampling errors. Linking model is theta i xi transpose b xi of the covariates. This is the regression parameter. And this is these uis of the random area effects. And target is, estimation of the theta i, i from one to n. The EIs are assumed to be independent. Now here comes a big question. DI, are, I should have said assume, it is assumed, I said that, known, that UI is uh, U0A, but A is unknown. The assumption of known DI is put to question because they're sample estimates. You cannot avoid it, non-identified. it. Combine the two. Yi is xi transpose b plus ui plus ei. And all you can estimate is the variability of ui plus ei. You cannot estimate the variability of each one individually. Unless you have micro data, you cannot estimate. If you have some extra data, which you can estimate the di. In recent times, I have got a couple of opportunities to get that different kind, but they're all outside the US, definitely outside the US Census Bureau. And they could actually estimate the GIs. Then you can add an extra level of modeling for the GIs also at the end. So you can see the non-identifiability issue is a big issue. 
So some notations are, these are the notations, y is this, e is this, u is e1, uh, the vector of the random fix, response, errors, regression parameters, covariance. And we assume the rank of x is p, which is smaller than n. In vector notations, we write y equal to theta plus e, theta is x beta plus u. So get the best linear and bias estimator of theta. It turns out to be this weighted average uh, of y and the regression part, regression estimate, xi transpose b tilde, b tilde is x transpose v inverse x, inverse x transpose v inverse y. The v is a diagonal matrix, bi is at this, the best linear unbiased predictor, best unbiased predictor under assumed, normal, under assumed normality, but you do not have to assume that. I do an alternative Bayesian formulation. It is exactly the same. Yi given theta i is a normal theta i, theta i given b, a normal xi transpose b given a, then the base estimator is exactly the same. Now, instead, if we put a uniform prior for B, the base estimator is same as this blob. This B is not B tilde. If we go back one step and use the B tilde, this is same thing. A is still known, but if you put a uniform prior on B, the base estimator for theta i is the same as this blob. But A is unknown, if B is unknown, you can put a prior for both B and A, and it has one advantage. Otherwise, estimate A for the resulting empirical base or empirical block. How we do that? Before I do that, I say my own preference is a hierarchical base. Because what you are doing, you are in an empirical base, you are just putting an estimator for the unknown parameters. In that way, you are not taking into the account the uncertainty involved in estimating the bond parameters. Small area people have done it, but it is typically an approximation. In a Bayesian way, you get immediately the posterior variance. Very simple, well-defined measure of uncertainty, whereas the frequentist, you have to do lots of interesting manipulations. Actually, in some sense, good, because you can write good papers showing with all the theoretical results, but so Fay and Harriet, what they did, they solve iteratively two equations. This is what the B tilde is, which I talked about, but they took the residual sum of squares also and equated that. As if you take the expectation of that, it is M minus P. So it was a method of moments. So just take the E out, the expectation, you equate the residual sum of squares to n minus p, which is equal to its expectation. Now, fair Harriet iterative methods are not too convenient. This is a classical paper. I'll talk quite a bit about it for the next few transparencies. Prasad and Rao suggested instead an unweighted least square approach to estimate it. So that v inverse is gone. This is not optimal by any means but it is convenient because now the expectation of the residual sum of squares, you come as a closed form, which is this. And then uh, this Ri is just the, what people call influence function, and that's what exactly is. So how do you estimate? You subtract this thing, the i is assumed known, divide by m minus p and estimate a, like I'm calling it a l hat, but there is a catch here. The method of moments approach always can give you a negative estimate of a positive quantity. So if you are negative, you force it to be zero. And that's why max of zero and this. Luckily for most of the, many of the examples, you do not get negative estimates, but there are situations where you cannot avoid. The BIs are estimated that way. Now we are estimating, the base estimated was bi yi plus bi b tilde a was known. So put al hat there, 
we are all had there but we till the ail hat i'm again sticking at the v inverse part but i'm putting ail hat so the prasadara approach only for estimating a they're using a suboptimal procedure <coughs> excuse me for estimating a they are using suboptimal for estimating once you estimate the a al hat they are still sticking with the best linear and best predictor with that estimate a for a al hat for a and they found their approximation to that's what i was trying to say it is also the base risk they didn't use anything hierarchical prior and now it is a very interesting thing the way they estimated the a the mean squared error breaks up into three orthogonal components this is the base estimate this is the empirical base estimate where b is unknown but a is known and this is the final empirical base estimate where both b and a are unknown the mean squared error breaks up into three pieces the first piece is theta i hat b minus theta i square the base risk if both b and a were known second part is the additional risk due to additional uncertainty estimation of bay b when a is known and the third part is exact uns uncertainty due to estimation of a this is an exact identity no problem just a matrix manipulation with statics model people are doing it all the time now comes the new thing the the first term you can get exclusive gi times second term you can get exclusive third term you cannot get exclusively they wanted an approximation you can see that what is the order the order is in inverse because if these things are constant the order is n there is n square so order is n inverse. so third term is an approximation so that's what i'm saying the empirical based approach for the mean squared error calculation you have to go for approximation which is correct up to order n minus 1 which is doing all right now how would you estimate typical people will say g1 i had g2 i had plus g3 i had these people are smart enough it got two g3 ia hat because they computed g1 ia hat up to the correct order term this thing is of order one these terms are all order n inverse both this and this so now if you calculate it you get the first term minus this g3 ia plus the terms which is of lower order than n inverse there has been further refinement with some g4 there i'm not going to get into it but because of this g1 i a hat plus g3 i a hat is g1 i a plus little o m inverse actually and that's why they did two g3 i a hat any question up to this technicalities because i I will say, give an example here. Any question here? If not, I'll move for- If I may point out the typo, Malaga. Oh yeah, there are many typos. <laughs> uh, one important is that uh, Fahariot's uh, iterative solution. Yeah, there is something. Uh, there, is, there is a VI inverse missing in the sum. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. For the next future. not Prasad Rao. Hey, yeah, fair oh. yeah. You have to go further up. Yeah, no, fair yet solution. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that the second, second, the last line that yi minus x and b tilde square. Uh, you forgot to divide by vi. Yeah, VI yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, not di, di. I mean, no. I mean, you divide by di plus a. Why i yeah, minus a? Second. That's what I'm saying. Which is vi? Correct. Yeah. Di plus a. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should have. Oh.
found it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He is absolutely right. Gauri, you are watching this? There is no reason. This is the Hanson lecture. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing it. So next time I have to give a talk in Poland about it. Again, virtual. <laughs> so I will correct that one definitely and correct some of the other typos also, as I'm saying, spelling and all that. An example is estimation of median income of four person families. Uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is doing that for years and years and years. Eligibility is determined by a formula. The important variable is an estimate of the current medium income of four person families by states, uh, 50 states and District of Columbia. Gauri, I, we are all both involved in this kind of thing for years. Dr. Lahiri is another person, several of us. The Bureau of Census provides such estimates to health and human services to a linear regression methodology. And Sample estimates are there for the current year, CPS as they call it, current population survey, is an every year thing. Years, years and years, Census Bureau is doing it, even before the turn of the century, for many, many years, I don't know how many. But they adjusted the census media, because this is the base year. As you are moving away more and more from the base year, it is becoming more and more unreliable. So what do you do? You multiply by this factor, the recent most recent, say 2000 is the recent most recent new census. I'm talking actually about 1980, I think, or 90, so 1970. The 1978, it is not all that great. So multiply the Bureau of Economic Analysis per capita income in year C to year B used as a dependent variable. So you are actually adjusting a bit with the per capita income, the change in the per capita income from the base year to the current base census year. But they did something more and somehow or other I thought they're overfitting, but it still worked pretty well. We use the census median for the base as the second independent variable. So you are using not only the B census median, but also a multiplier of B as a covariate. And apparently that is still, it was working well. Anyway, you compare the empirical base, current population survey, Bureau of Census uh, estimates against the 1990-79 census estimate. This comparison was based on four criteria. This was recommended as small area estimates, population income. That was the Committee of National Statistics. I was not in that committee, but they recommended this average relative bias. Average squared relative bias, average absolute bias, and average squared deviation. The truth minus the estimate. But you have to know the truth. There should be a gold standard. In this case, we took the gold standard for 1989-1990 census figure. There is always a one year, actually, lag. And 1990 census figure was given. That was taken as the truth. And these are the estimates. So 1990 census figure was used as the truth. And what you got was this empirical base estimate. The previous estimates of the Bureau have not talked about. Sample median is the worst for average, all four criteria. Look at the square relative bias is better, but the empirical base was doing much better in all four criteria. And that is actually so fair approach was working very well here. But then from, I tried something based on 1980 census and then the whole string of years following and tried to predict in 1990, the 1989 figure, I found it was better to use only that just a sample median and not put the sample median in addition. So it happened that way. There is a several things. Uh, Partho Lahiri and John Rao, they avoid normality, assume eighth moment. Gauri actually has a very, very important paper, much more important <laughs> in some sense from a theoretical point of view, because instead of moment method based method, they're using ML, maximum likelihood, and REML, restricted maximum likelihood for estimation of various components in linear mixed model. 
And there is a host of other papers which I'm not going to discuss. Uh, Kalan Das, Jiming Zhang, John Rao, then Jiming Zhang, Dr. Lahiri, Chen and Lahiri, Buddha and Lahiri, Yosemary, that's the most recent one I worked with. Nasal, now this is Hirose actually, but she used to be also married. But there are some conditional approach by Fuller, Booth, and Hogarth, and others. This one. Uh, let us talk, let me talk a general bit about the general exponential family. Uh, I take the general exponential family like Bernoulli. But the parameter, canonical parameter is the logit, per person, the canonical parameter is the log, and model the theta i with normal this, or, or, or use beta prior for the pi, gamma prior for the lambda i's, estimate an empirical base approach, put a prior distribution, and Melek et al. talked about small examples, smaller estimation, etc., etc. There are other papers as well. I'll just briefly mention, uh, maybe the time is coming, actually cutting short. There was actually uh, only the sampling model. You can do that. A more frequentist approach, unbiased estimator of the above NSC using a kind of frequentist approach in the sense, given theta. Base risk means what? Average over the distribution of yi's and theta i's, and here it is conditional theta i's, and that's what they did, and they had another interesting chance of paper. That's the only difference. So unit-specific models talk a little bit, uh, briefly. The unit-specific auxiliary variables are av available. So you have ni units with a sample of size ni, sample observations are yi1 to yi ni, and the model is just giving this yi j xij transpose b plus ui plus eij. Any effect plus the errors. That's what we're talking about. But now you are in a better shape because you have the error variance, <coughs> sorry, sigma squared multiplied by something as well as the area level variance. And you can estimate both. And that's what they did. I'll just talk about briefly, because there's a classical paper again, which is Hutter and Fuller. It is area devoted to corner soybean for the J segment in the county. Xij is the vector of covariance. So even if you're interested in corn, or even if you're interested in soybean, they use the number of pixels, the elements, both for the corn and soybean. They found it was better we use both the corn and soybean for covariates as covariates, even though you're interested in one of the crops. These are the regression coefficient, the shy ij in the previous paper, in the previous slide, I put it as one, that's what they took. But in another paper by John and myself, it was a review article 27 years ago, as you can see. Uh, the Problem was wages and salaries for the jade business in the highest census division. Xij is an intercept and the gross business income of the jade highest census division. So it was better to use Xij, XXIJ than the usual model involving homoscedasticity. So just a little bit of algebra again, Betty Sutter and Full model. I can write it in this way and then these are the xi bar and yi bar. The target is estimation of xi transpose b, xi bar transpose b, we're taking the average plus ey and i is the only other part. So for known sigma u squared, you get the blot just like a weighted average of the direct estimate and the regression estimate, except the, the shrinkage factor bi the, is given by this. And B hat, B tilde is just like before. So blob of this thing is given by this thing, the best linear unbiased predictor. And method of moment to get unbiased estimators of unknown sigma square, sigma square, the E blob of Xi bar transpose B plus Ui 
is found by substituting these estimates in the Bluff formula. And we're giving the exact results that involve two ordinary least squares regression, estimation of sigma squares involve moment estimation based on the residual sum of squares. And the next equation involves residual sum of squares by regressing yij on the xij minus x. A full hierarchical Bayesian approach appears in the paper by Gori and myself. That was, again, 30 years ago, three decades, Annals of Statistics, 1991. And what was the example? Predict areas under corn and soybean for 12 counties in north central Iowa based on, this is the enumerative survey as well as satellite data. And fields of survey determined areas under corn and soybean. In Iowa, these are the two principal crops. And North Central Iowa, I think that's what it is. They had 37 sample segments, 12 counties. So naturally you can see very few observations within a county. And based on this Landsat readings, they also used to classify the crop cover for all pixels. Again, what it, in the 12 counties. This example I mentioned earlier. And we have the HB predictors, EB predictors of Betty, Sutter, and Fuller, and associated standard error, of course, for the mean areas under 12 counts. BHF and our empirical base was, I think, a little bit different. And this is the figures. So, one thing you can see that typically the hierarchical base standard errors a little bigger than the ones for empirical base, although it is, there is no mathematical formula except in a very special case one can show that. Here, most of the cases it is, except in I think one case as I can see that. But why it is so? That is typically what you expect, because in a hierarchical base procedure, I take into account the uncertainty due to estimation of the model parameters, where an empirical base approach, you directly plug in the estimates and pretend as if that is the genuine thing without taking the uncertainty into account. But it's sort of fuller, usually I'm saying sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, and actually there is no such thing. The estimates are fairly close, and that's, of course, what we have found. There is not much difference in the estimates. Hmm? How, how are we in time? Any question? Hmm. How I'm doing in time? Is it bad? <laughs> I may have to cut down then something. These are the more modern things. This is one of the stories, which is, I think, if I have 20 minutes, I can finish it, possibly. But uh, then there will be. Yeah, I think uh, since we got a bit delayed, I think we have 20 minutes from the original schedule. So I think you could. Part, try and finish in 20 minutes, yes. Okay, thank you. Benchmarking. The problem is the following. This came in the early 90s. And then, of course, this thing got a big pull in current years because everyone is trying. The model-based small area estimates when aggregated may not equal the corresponding estimate for the larger area. On the other hand, the direct estimate for the larger area at a national level is quite reliable. If I have a national estimate, then the states can become small areas. And for the states, actually, when you aggregate all the small estimates, whatever way model you have used, you don't aggregate to the national estimate. And then there is a problem. That is, first of all, in my mind, there is, of course, there, there is a political problem. Definitely, yes. I'll give an example. But the matching the letter may be a good idea, for instance, to protect against model failure and very often for political reasons. So suppose I'm interested in theta t, the direct estimate should be nine, not equal to the model-based estimator. Uh, when you do that, so what you do, actually, and two principal things is ratio adjusted, because when you multiply the summation wj, this thing, this thing gets canceled and you get the direct. And difference. W, you multiply by summation w, wi and then sum, the thing cancels out and you get the matching. Long time ago, 
that was one of the interesting stories. Uh, I was involved in a survey about people without health insurance in the counties in, uh, some, uh, in, in Florida. Then they, the next year, they went from counties to the census block. We did design the survey with the targeted accuracy at the county level. Then there are 9,000 census blocks and we had 17,000 samples. So you can imagine what will happen. They estimate, then they actually got some other people outside the university to do the analysis. I don't know why. Anyway, they get the estimates and they got it. Then they got very afraid. They said it is not matching overall, at least it was in the late 90s. They contacted me and not knowing anything about benchmarking at that stage, all I said from my naivety, just multiply, adjust it by ratio of 10, of what I just gave you, you get that estimate, just you by multiply. And they're extremely happy. They're even ready to pay me for that, just that observation. And that was one of the most amusing stories I have had in my life. One criticism against such adjustments though is a common for small areas, regardless of their precision. Wang, Fuller, and Chu proposed instead minimizing a weighted average, not just the squared error, but a weighted squared error subject to the constraint and resulting estimate we got like that. And Gauri, myself, one of my, another of my students, Rebecca Stoltz, Jerry Maples, so that we took a general Bayesian approach and minimize this subject to this constraint. Looks similar, but not quite. It is expectation of EJ given. Uh, no, it should be theta hat actually, isn't it? EJ my sorry, this should be a theta hat, sub subject to that. And we got the same kind of estimates with the same uh, 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 lambda i. But what is the advantage of a Bayesian, our Bayesian approach? It did not require any kind of model assumption. Give me a set of base estimate uh, posterior means and the posterior variance covariance matrix. We can produce directly in our paper. We could produce the benchmark estimates. Now this extends to multiple benchmark constraints in a frequentist con context. Of course, Bell, myself, and Gauri, uh, Bill Bell of the Census Bureau extended the work of Wang, Fuller, and Chu. There and also there are situations when I need two-stage benchmarking. One of the examples was the cash rent estimates. NAS is a part of the, actually, National Center for Health Statistics, but needs the dual control of matching the aggregate of county-level cash rent estimates to the corresponding agricultural district comprising of several counties and the aggregate of agriculture district-level estimates to the final state-level estimates. And two state benchmarking we did. Actually, Emily Berg, uh, there is the most recent Will Cesaria, Andrea Ersuescu, and myself serving as logic. That's one of the recent papers. So, dual two stage benchmarking. So, first, match the uh, what is it called? Agricultural district to the corresponding benchmark those and use those benchmark estimates to match the corresponding county level estimates benchmark estimate and you can do it with a single model as Becca and I uh, found that. So second order mean squared estimators are not available unlike uh, for the ratio adjusted but for the uh, MSC estimators we could do that uh, pretty easily. Uh, again a paper a PhD dissertation of Becca Stoves and myself we have shown that the only thing is we had to use it's another additional term uh, when you computed the squared error, but we could use still the MSC of uh, whatever you uh, MSC of the original empirical base estimate. The Prasada of second order unbiased estimate put G4 a hat, still it is of order n inverse, and that's all you need to do. Now, there are two available approaches for self benchmarking but which do not require any adjustment to the e blob, And this changes the MSC calculation. That's why I brought it up. 
So if we use the self-adjusted benchmark estimate, MSC of theta i had b, because uh, originally it was G2i, means the G2i changes. G1i and G3i remain intact, but G3i changes. And second approach, Wang, Fuller, and Chu was using an augmented model using this, and we extended, Bill, Rodi, and myself extended. This is more exciting. Fixed versus random effects, a different, less, but equally pertinent issue has recently surfaced. Need for random effects in all areas or whether even fixed effects models would be adequate for certain areas. And Gauri, Peter Hall, and Abhu Daimandal were the first to address the problem. They suggested essentially a preliminary taste space approach testing the null hypothesis, common random effect was zero. If it is zero, it is a fixed effect. If it is not zero, based on the your hypothesis test, it is a random effect, acceptance or rejection of the null hypothesis. This amounted to use of the synthetic or regression estimates for upon acceptance of the null hypothesis and composite estimates, which are weighted average of direct and regression estimates. So all, either all of them are just uh, fixed effects or all of them are random effects. Now, Gauri being a smart pie, very quickly realized the problem. And uh, the that the whole bundle procedure works well when the number of small areas is moderately large, but not necessarily when the number of small areas is very large. They found it out. The null hypothesis of no random effects is very likely to be rejected. And they showed it with examples. A few large residuals causing significant departure from direct estimates from the regression estimates. This was realized by Datta and Mandel, who proposed instead a mixture model for random effects with spy and slab priors. These priors put a positive mass at zero, resulting spike and slab priors is spikes at zero, and then you are having actually taper soft towards the end where you have significant effects. Put a positive result in a spike at zero, the slab part, they use a normal distribution, zero means, and come unknown variance. If you recall the original models which are here, all you have to do for the area effects UI, just put delta I UI, the delta I are Bernoulli gamma, UI is just like before, but you are putting this additional. So sometimes it is a zero, with a good high probability, sometimes it is not a zero. Now, one thing later, in contrast, we are all JASA papers, <laughs> all these papers. Spike and slot priors of Gauri and of Buddha. Uh, Shing Tang, another PhD student of mine, myself, uh, postdoc Ha, and Joe Sedransk, we consider a different class of priors. It meets the same objectives. As spike and slab, but uses instead absolutely continuous. You don't get exact zeros with positive probability because you get a zero, exact zero with zero probability. But this price allow different various components for different small areas, intent to capture local small area effects better than the priors of Gauri and Abuda, who considered only the prevalence of zero or else common. So particularly useful. So what is fair areas? They're shrinking everything towards a particular. Variants. Gauri and Abhuda used very nice thing, not just either zero or that is a common variance. Instead, we could accommodate multiple variances. And we found when you are going for very large number of small areas, more than 3,000 counties, when we expect a wide variation of county effects, this priors doing pretty well. They're called global local shrinkage priors. I'll immediately uh, in the not May not be the next slide, but the slide after that. Uh, developed for an entirely different purpose by Carvalho, Paulson Scott, Paulson Scott, and a host of others. Goal is the capture potential sparsity. What it means? Lack of significant contribution by many of the random effects, assigning large probabilities of random effects close to zero, but also identifying random effects which differ significantly from zero. This is achieved by employing two levels of parameters to express, I'll write it in symbols in the next slide. But here now I'm saying local shrinkage parameters act, global shrinkage parameters, that's fair area, shrinking everything 
towards the grand average. And local shrinkage analysts tried to protect the local areas by using additional components. Fay Harriet, one global parameter, Gauri and Dutta, the variance parameter random effects, either zero or common across all areas. Specifically, the UIs in our case have normal zero. This A is the same as Fehrier's global effect and lambda square are the local effect. The A is trying to cause an overall shrinking effect. The local shrinkage parameters are useful in controlling the degree of shrinkage at the local level. Now, if the mixing density corresponding to the local, they are all scale mixtures of normal. Believe me or not, I possibly should have mentioned in the last transparency, they're all scale mixtures of normal, what we used. Approximately heavy tail, large random effects are almost left unshrunk. And that is a whole host of other priors, which are actually included in this general class, uh, which we used. Just an example, basically, estimate the five-year county level overall poverty rates. So there are so many counties. These are the covariates. And we could find the poverty rates are quite small in one of the counties in Texas and extremely high in one of the counties in South Dakota. The median was this. Some of the states, 55% of the counties have poverty rates above the third quartile, which was this. And then below the first quartile, which was this, 11.1, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, one, Hawaii, and New Jersey. There is a picture which does not mean much as such. We have given the whole, the same thing which you talked about at different uh, levels of scarcity, actually. That's what it is. The final thing is variable transmission. I'm working with this now with one of my students and of colleagues, uh, Masao Hirose, who used to be Masao Yoshimori. Often the normality assumption can be justified only of the transformation of the regional data. Then one performs analysis based on the transformed data, but transformed back properly to the original scale to arrive at the final conclusion. Common example is skewed positive data, for example, income, the log transformation is closer. The two papers, Slada and Mighty, JRSS B, myself and Kubakov, providing final results for back transform data. Just to show you what it, why one has to be careful, consider a multiplicative model. So then you take the log, it becomes a linear model. Use the fair area. And use the exact, but the log of phi, use theta. Now, some people may say just exponentiate, then you'll get theta i hat because theta is log of pi i. No. Expectation of pi i given zi, if you do just compute this, it is exactly this. So if you just use this, you are into, use exponential theta i and p, you are introducing the bias. So this is an important. Another interesting example, variance stabilizing transformation. That's what we are working. Uh, YI, independent binomial NIPI, uh, Masao Hiroshi and I, we have a revised paper now in uh, Statistica Seneca. Uh, that is the art sign transformation I used. And if you just go back, the PI will be this. You just cannot do it. So you have to take care of it. And for the Poisson model for count data, that is with, uh, again, Masal and my student, Kamal Ghosh, uh, they are used the very stabilizing, then it becomes eta i4, one four. Added advantage here, the known assumption of known di, which is always untrue, can be avoided. As I said, the topics I covered is only a small fraction, maybe an epsilon fraction, I would say in these days, the topics I have not covered. Design consistency. Survey people use designs, not just models. Special space time models, spatial temporal measurement errors and covariates. All these areas, a lot of work has been done. Poverty counts, empirical based confidence intervals. Gauri has contributed quite a bit in that area. Bartha has also contributed. 
robust malaria estimation, a specification of linking model, informative sampling, Danny Koffer Pfefferman is an expert on that, constraints malaria estimation, disease mapping, and you can the list goes on and on and on. So it is a very, very fertile area of research. It does not require too much background, and you can one can still work a lot, actually, and new things are coming up every single day. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I've just taken an hour and 10 minutes to talk. <laughs> and thank you very much. And I will be happy to answer questions even beyond one o'clock, okay? Because that's because we started late. Although it is too late in India, it is already at about 10.30. Yeah, approaching 10.30, that's right. But that was the scheduled time. So it's, I think people have planned for this. So thank you, Professor Ghosh, for a very nice talk. Any questions? Anybody have any comments or questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah. You're muted. I'm sorry. Shall I mute myself? Sorry. 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 Yeah. So, uh, so the question that I have that in a uh, typical uh, survey methodology, we know that yeah. no matter what you try, uh, some of the uh, you know minority uh, will be always less represented in the sample, right? right. I mean, uh, we do know that African Americans will be always uh, less represented. We do know that uh, Adivasis will be always less, less represented in the in Indian context. So these things is uh, globally known to us. What I would like to know this recent uh, development of literature of the shrinkage prior from uh, slap and slap prior to say horseshoe prior, what all these developments, did they able to address this issue of uh, minority representation in the survey? Can use those models. Earlier, Dori and I, uh, we worked on 1980s press rehearsal data given to us by the Census Bureau. And it was the whole pick, the title of the paper is undercount estimation. So if we could use that, yeah, you can use a multivariate model. We use a multivariate model. You can use multivariate, those models are not. Question is whether it is doing the right thing. Sure, we can use these models. There is no question about it. Whether the models will give the desired results, that I don't know. And that's true about everything, of course. And of course, as I tell everyone, if the original data is not trustworthy all that much, whatever model they use, it will be bad. Whatever is, it is. Uh, is it possible to do uh, some sort of simulated design study to check whether yeah. these kind of priors actually address uh, these very important issues of minority underrepresentation in a survey. Yeah, that's a very, very important point. I totally agree with this. Uh, I, yes, it can be used and possibly some, one should possibly try. And then, I don't know where the Census Bureau is doing this kind of stuff. They're only interested in that. Gauri, can you tell anything about it? Whether this undercount thing is a big issue anymore? Uh, I'm not sure, Malaga, uh, but you know, uh, you have to have your design in such a way that you capture them. I mean, okay, if you yeah. don't get anything in the sample, then only based on covariate uh, adjustment, uh, I don't know how good that, that would be. That won't help. You have to have some kind of idea. Yeah, that won't. Just covariate adjustment of not much. Uh, I just have one more question. So it is more like ad hoc question, not uh, related to small area estimation. Rather, I think it's a more, um, you know, uh, quintessential uh, thing for the statisticians that our subject is evolving because the data itself is evolving from handwritten to we are going into a digital era. So now every, everything is going from statistics to data science. I would like to know what is your thought on that? That is, it is unavoidable, actually. <laughs> it is unavoidable. 
Statisticians have to possibly work with, <laughs> in collaboration with other scientists. They cannot avoid it, especially this artificial intelligence, all these, uh, what are the buzzwords? Deep learning and all that. You have to, uh, unless it is a team effort, it possibly won't yield very much. That's my own understanding. It has to be a team effort and of course, uh, our university is hiring people in AI, artificial intelligence. They are hiring people neither in statistics nor in computer science. They said the application people, they will just apply. They are hiring people, for example, in liberal arts and science, they are hiring people in anthropology. If they are not, uh, they are in geography. Two positions to anthropology and two positions to geography. I don't know why. Maybe one and one. Because all the schools are now uh, buying from the same buy. <laughs> Actually, they're not <laughs> trying. Uh, so that's what it is. But uh, I think both statisticians, mathematicians, computer scientists, maybe all of them, and for this kind of thing, even the economists, I would, I would say, they all have to be coming to the forefront. The undercount adjustment is a big thing. Now, I'm sure there is a group in the census bureau. Gaudi doesn't work with that group, but there must be something. But whether papers are being published on that, I don't know. I don't see very much. Maybe there are, which I have not seen. But yes, it has to be statistics. We have to act in collaboration. We just, otherwise, we will very soon lose our identity very quickly. A computer scientist will take over. Whatever they produced. <laughs> so I think this underground issue is not only issue in statistics, it is also a serious problem in uh, even machine learning and artificial intelligence. For example, in Google, yeah. in uh, there is there uh, uh, in there was a uh, I think there was a paper by um, a lady uh, who recently completed the PhD thesis from Stanford and they figured out that there are machine learning algorithms which are uh, basically discriminating against the uh, African Americans. Now, uh, now the, 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 when I went through their paper, I realized that the machine learning algorithms uh, were basically they were using some face recognition uh, algorithms and the, uh -huh. fish, the, 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 the data on which the algorithm was trained, it was basically the data had misrepresentation of African-Americans. And if naturally, if you're the train, if the data on which your algorithm you're training, it has mis, uh, African-Americans are less represented, naturally your algorithm will not do well when you will ask, a face to recognize, which is more look like African-American rather than a white American or European American. So as a result, so I think this is this under representation issue in the sample is not going to not only biting us in the statistician, it is going to bite even in the artificial intelligence and machine learning problems as well. So it is actually not a problem only for the statistician. It is, I think it could be a problem for everybody, I think. And the problem with the artificial intelligence is then it is, we are basically uh, automating the, you know, undercounting problem without understanding sometimes even. And that's, that's uh, in clinical trial also, right? That uh, underrepresented so that that is i think in a lot of uh, areas that's a uh, uh, issue and uh, you know uh, research are going on to address that uh, so so uh, dr ghosh uh, it's a wonderful talk and a huge coverage uh, so is there any uh, so as you as you mentioned that uh, ai ml or deep learning so is there any application in 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 small area estimation of ai ml in recent times on that I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someone else uh, could be could, could machine learning application. Uh, techniques are there. The machine learning ideas can definitely be used in small area, even for variable selection. Yeah. Right? Yes. You have a large number of variables. 
use a classical box, lasso or something, the Bayesian versions of lasso, etc., etc., yes. etc. Et mm -hmm. You can use. Mm -hmm. That's definitely. Uh, I have not seen mm -hmm. variable selection in survey of small area, whatever it is, small mm -hmm. area when you yeah, have twenty variables, maybe only three are part in it. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Definitely, I'm talking not just. Uh, the fixed or random area effects, I'm talking now about variable selection. Addition. Now, uh, I have one successful example, but that was, I think, a scientist in our College of Agriculture was trying to vary. A, he works on tomatoes, I think, basically. Tomatoes, all sorts of interesting things. I don't recall exactly what it is. He approached me once, actually, about variable selection. There's so many variables, auxiliary variables. How do I? Yeah. So at that time, a student of mine, uh, whose paper is receiving a lot of such Chalfons, shoe, he was working on actually uh, group class. Mm. And, and all that, the frequent disaster, but he was working on Bayesian. So he used the lasso, a much, much better result that forward or backward selection, which is the yes. classical of those people. So it all depends, actually. It is, yep. But if the data is bad, as story is the same, it is really a disaster, <laughs> typically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there is one question in the chat box. Is only log normal distribution used or any other Custom distributions are assumed to arrive at varied solutions. Variable. Yeah. Oh, variable transformation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have used already uh, the R sign. And uh, we have, uh, I have a paper actually, a revised version of the paper with Herosin, actually. And also a revised version, essentially revised, which is about to be submitted with Kamal and Herosin, both. Some, some data. There are applications. Kamal used a very, uh, I don't know, I, I was not all that keen, but they wanted some modern application. Hiroshi's application was also related to COVID-19 data. Mm. And so was Tamal's. So I've signed COVID-19 data, where we are talking about people infected, people making fatality, whatever you want. Proportions, estimation of proportions, or estimation yeah. Estimating counts, estimating proportions or estimating counts. So Poisson is used and arc sign transformation for binomial and square root transformation for Poisson is used, but there are other things also. I recently encountered a paper, my colleague pointed out a very stabilizing transformation for negative binomial. So even if you have an over dispersed population, instead of Person, you use a negative binomial, you can still do variance stabilizing transformation. But one has to possibly use something. That would be an interesting thing. Yeah. There is some quite often over dispersion. And when you have over dispersion, of course, the variance will depend <laughs> on the mean, just like Person and negative binomial. But you can yes. make a variance stabilizing transformation there also. And get and achieve homoscedasticity. Good. This oh, is Diman. Uh, sir, yeah, Diman, please go ahead. Diman, please go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sir, I have a question regarding the use of informative priors in the context of small area estimation. So, you know, are there instances where you know priors are being shown to you know, sure. result in significantly better posteriors and eventually inferences compared to, you know, the run of the mill, you know, non-informative priors. Yeah. But, you know, really we are using experience or previous data to construct a prior, which yeah. enhances or enriches our understanding of the posterior in the context of small area estimation. Okay. Uh, of course, it has a different target, sparsity. The global local priors 
of course, you can use it. Uh, for the regression coefficient, you can put a flat prior, but for the uh, otherwise, it is a proper prior. You are talking about, I think, the regression part. That's where the yeah. proper prior is coming in. Yeah, possibly the proper prior there also could be used. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. The regression part, whether it will do significantly something better or not, but it may. Yeah, I was thinking of informative priors. In the yeah, 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 sure. So the sp spike and slap priors you talked about, uh, uh, are those informative priors or? You know, yeah, they... uh, because we are using sc direct scale mixtures of normals. So it is informative in some sense, depending on which parameters you're assigning. But what some people are doing they're trying to put actually even priors on those hyper parameters, lambda squares and all that, hierarchical Bayesian. That is being used. So once you do that, it is becoming more non-informative because they don't want to use informative. But if you want to use, um, sure. Yeah. Lambda squares, you're putting different types of priors, all these horseshoe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that, all this is there. Sigma square you can put. And that's what we are essentially doing in our analysis. Okay, so I think in some sense that is informative. From from your definition, it possibly I will label it as informative prior. Okay. okay. Thank you. I will label it as that. And there, they should be used more. Uh, my colleague Brenda Bettencourt saying she she and one of her colleagues from somewhere Chile or some, somewhere in Latin America they are also trying to use for smaller estimation these global local products. Gauri, are you using that also? You may be. Please go. On. No, thank you, sir. No, that was. Thank you. It is already too late <laughs> in India. Not here. Here it is the prime of the day, prime time. No question about it. Thank you for all your questions and comments. Yeah, I think, yeah, Madhavan, yeah, you can. Yeah, I think uh, we are done, yeah. I think, with yeah. questions. So thank you again. Uh, so, so much. And uh, we hope to visit you guys. <laughs> yeah, so we are we are yeah. looking forward to it, and I know a short course, at least a short course, will be wonderful <laughs> from you. Yeah. yeah. So so we can discuss that separately, and we exactly. certainly would be very happy to, when it uh, is possible, to have you visit us. But uh, even before that, yeah, some more online interaction we would welcome. That so, would be so, yeah. so 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 we'll be in touch about that, and thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. sir. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sir. Happy thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you very much. All of you, uh, very happy National Statistics Day. <laughs> <laughs> we have thank you, <laughs> oh, thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Stay bye -bye. safe, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.